And so, Emmanuel, we thank you that you come to us even though we complain about it all the time. I was just thinking about what we were singing, and Emmanuel means God with us, like the God-man, and Israel means he who wrestles with God, the one who wrestles with God, and Lord God, that's what you do, isn't it? You show up and you wrestle us at the edge of the promised land, beat the crap out of us sometimes, and then bless us more than we could possibly even begin to comprehend. And Lord, uh, you're the word. So Lord, we ask that you would maybe even do that now. And in advance, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, feel free to have a seat. Um, This is Thanksgiving weekend. It's often kind of a strange weekend because the usuals are traveling and more unusuals are here. But this looks like the usual unusuals for the most part. So I just want to say it's great to it's great to see you. Um, We just finished our eight part series, in case you didn't know, uh, that we uh, titled um, Gospel New Ancient Foundations. The gospel is simple. And yet the lies that we have believed about the gospel are just as complex as as hell. The sermons were these. Number one, hell, the imaginary elephant in the middle of the room. Number two, creation, did God lose control of time? Number three, anthropology, what is an atom and how do you make one? Number four, the fall, the doctrine of original ignorance. Number five, the judgment, there's only one. Number six, the atonement, the tree in the middle of the garden. Number seven, love and law, saved by free will, from free will, for free will. Number eight, eschatology, God is salvation, wins, and has always won. And that's the gospel. God is salvation, which in a word, as you know, forms a name, and the name is Jesus, Yeshua. The practical application point is believe it, but I know that that still may raise a question. How do I believe it? I mean, I get the idea that faith is a miracle, but what can I do? How can, can I help? In other words, what is the will of God for me? What do I do? Isn't that what we all want to know? I mean, what can I do to get me to be blessed by God in all of his blessings? What is the will of God for me? I ask that question all the time. So if you ask that question all the time, I'm in the same boat. In the the Old Testament, the will of God is very practical and specific. It's often called the law. I read somewhere that there are actually 613 laws in the Old Testament. The scribes and the Pharisees came up with thousands and thousands more uh, laws to make those 613 more laws more practical, applicable, and comprehensible. But when you get to the New Testament, practical, applicable, and comprehensible don't really seem to fit. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself? Is that practical? Pick up a cross. Is that applicable? (laughs) I mean, I've never actually seen anybody do that except for maybe in an Easter show or something. Do this in remembrance of me. This is my body, this is my blood. Eat it, drink it. Is that comprehensible? I mean, we fight wars over that. But strangely, it is applicable, right? I mean, it is something you can actually, you can actually kind of like do. I'm just saying I totally get the question, what is the will of God in Christ Jesus for, for me? Who am I supposed to marry? Where am I supposed to live? How many beers can I have on the weekend? Does God want me to be a missionary or can I sell cars? I totally get why people ask these questions. And I totally get why people want me to come up with the answer or make one up. Religion. It's my job. This past summer, some of us were asking, should we sell this building? I mean, there are hundreds of things to be considered, thousands of variables, contingencies, stuff we don't know, and God knows it all. 
So I was just begging God, what is your will for us in Christ Jesus? Susan walks into my office one day and says, I heard Jesus say, tell Peter to read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So I read it, a bunch of gobbledygook about return of Christ, faith, eschatology, all that kind of stuff. And then this line caught my attention. Uh, chapter 5, verse 18. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I mean, people must have been asking Paul that question all the time, right? What is the will of God in Christ Jesus for me? I ask Paul that question all the time. What is the will of God in Christ Jesus? Here's the answer. It's at least four things, all right, that come before um, this sentence. So we're going to unpack it in, in reverse r rather quickly right now. So 1 Thessalonians 5, 15, um, right? Th this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for, for you, that's, that's, the, that's the question, or that's what, that's what we're looking for, and then this is how it starts. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always, always seek to do good to one another and uh, to everyone. Did Paul, did Paul mean that? Never repay evil with evil. I mean, we do live in America, right? We have a justice, the lady with the balances and everything. You know, most people seem to think that God pays back a little evil with like a whole bunch of endless evil called, called hell. And Paul just said, see that no one does that. How could Paul possibly tell us to imitate God our Father and then tell us never pay back evil with evil if God pays back evil with just horrendous, endless evil. Well, he doesn't. God pays back evil with Jesus, <laughs> the good. That he does pay back evil with evil was lie number one. Remember the elephant in the middle of the room. The lie that God is not always salvation, that is Jesus. So back to our verse. Okay, so number one, see that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do the good to one another and to everyone. Number two, rejoice always. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Have you ever tried to rejoice always? It'll make you sad. Believe me, I was a youth pastor. Yeah, let's go TP another house. Woohoo, this is awesome. Stay up all night long. In the 70s, charismatic movement, everybody was into rejoicing always. So I remember a bunch of middle aged women and leotards running around the church with streamers. Made me sad. Sorrow is better than laughter, writes Solomon. For by sadness of face, the heart is made glad. Vietnam War, civil rights movement, Watergate, and rejoice always. How? I mean, I don't know if, you're, if this sounds familiar, but in the 70s, it felt like God had lost control of time. That was line number two, that God has lost control of time and so failed at his purpose in creation. So back to our verse. Number one, see that no one repays evil with evil, but always seek to do the good to one another and to everyone. Number two, rejoice always. Number three, pray constantly. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you, Peter. Have you ever tried to pray constantly? Like you just made that? It, it's hard to think of things to say, isn't it? And then this is a problem. Do you keep praying while you're looking at the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue? Or you just kind of stay quiet, keep it under the radar so Jesus doesn't notice? Remember line number three was that we each create ourselves and so each and all of us are alone. So anyway, what is the will of God in Christ Jesus uh, f for me? 1 Thessalonians 5, 15. See that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do the good to one another and to everyone. Number two, rejoice always. Number three, pray constantly. Number four, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Literally translated, give thanks in all or in everything. And that sounds kind of insane. 
And yet I kind of can actually sort of do that. I mean, that's like a practical application point, right? I mean, I can make myself say thank you and with a mustard seed of faith, maybe actually mean it a little bit. Thank you in everything. In the midst of the Vietnam War, as my mom runs around the church in leotards, Thank you, but for what? That Jesus wins in, in the end, even though people are dying in the steaming jungles of Vietnam? That mom loves me even though she wears leotards? Well, actually, I don't think my mom ever did wear leotards in church. I was just scared to death she would because the other ladies were doing that, and it was seventh grade, and I was just praying, please don't let her wear it. Anyway, thank you, God, but for what? For what? Ephesians 5.18. Be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody of the Lord with all your heart. So yeah, I get the whole leotard and streamer thing. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Always and for everything. Well, that would give you something to talk to God about, right? Just whatever popped into your head, whatever popped up before your face. 1 Timothy 4.4, 4, for everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified. That means it's made holy. And you remember holy uh, refers to the seventh day. It's made somehow e e eternal. It's God's promise rest. It's the kingdom come. Nothing is to be rejected this is crazy. Nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy, maybe even eternal, with the word of God and prayer. So always and everything is made holy. With the word of God spoken as a prayer of thanksgiving. Give thanks always and for everything. Give thanks in everything. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So there you have it. Stop your bitching and moaning and just do it. I'm going to stop talking now for like 30 seconds, just half a minute. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to close your eyes, okay? And, you, and I'm not going to ask you to do this out loud because then you'll be distracted. But you're going to close your eyes. And when I say go, you're just going to start thanking God for everything that pops into your head. That's called your psyche, okay? You're just going to Thank God. Okay, ready? So close your eyes. Everybody close. You're looking at me, Marsha. I saw that. Close your eyes. And when I say so, go. Go. Twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty. Okay, you can stop. How was it? You know, if you really thank God always and for everything, wouldn't you eventually come to believe that nothing happened to you by chance? And absolutely everything was a gift. For God was like telling a story. A good story. That's, that's called gospel. The gospel according to you, which would be your life. And that would undo the rest of the lies. Number four, that everything is your fault. Number five, that the judgment is not grace. Number six, that we are not forgiven. Number seven, that if we lose our psyche, we won't find it. And number eight, that God is salvation is not the beginning, the end, and the way in between. All those lies undone if we actually gave thanks always and for everything in everything. But who actually does that? 
Seriously. So anyway, you tried for half a minute. How'd it go? So let me ask you some questions, okay? N number one, how many of you thanked God for a good thing? But most everybody, right? You thank God for, for, for a good thing. So now you don't have to raise your hands anymore. <laughs> but ask yourself, do you own that good thing? Okay, so just answer in your head. If you do own the good thing, did you earn that good thing? In other words, you got a right to that good thing. If you think you earned your house, your car, your Thanksgiving dinner, how can you actually be grateful or thankful for your house, your car, your Thanksgiving dinner? If you earned those things yourself, did you earn yourself? The self that earned those things? In other words, are you your own uncreated creator? What do you have that you did not receive? Asked Paul in 1 Corinthians 4, 17, 4, 4, 4, 7. If you think you own those things because you earned those things, I don't think you actually own them. They own you. That's the danger of riches. There's no problem with making just tons of money. The problem is with keeping your money when your neighbor's in need. Because if you keep the money, you'll try to convince yourself that you have earned that money. You'll justify yourself. You'll convince yourself that you tried to earn that money, which makes you a slave to that money and the illusion that you have created yourself. But when you thank God for a thing, it transforms that thing from an idol into a temple. That is a, a way to worship God who owns everything and freely gives everything to you. Oh, the moon belongs to everyone. The best things in life are free. The stars belong to everyone. They glimmer for you and for me. The flowers in spring, the robins that sing, the sunbeams that shine, they're yours and they're mine, and love can come to everyone. The best things in life are free. You know, life is actually a communion of sacrificial love, and God is love. You can't pay for God. So all things in life are free. And all things are yours, writes Paul to the Corinthians. So you do own the moon, actually. And so do I. But as long as neither of us loves the rest of us, perhaps it's best if God doesn't hand the keys over to any of us. Not quite yet. Because what would we be doing? We'd be using the moon as a weapon. <laughs> crashing it into our neighbor's car, or their dog that barks all night long. I mean, God must be like a father who says to his five-year-old, look, everything I have belongs to you. My very heart belongs to you, and I am bound and determined to prove it to you, but you're not quite ready yet to drive the car or run the family business. Well, thank God for, for good things. That's safe for you. You should always thank God for good things so that they don't become idols. How many of you thank God for a bad thing? And now you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you thank God for a bad thing? How about the 1979 Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition? I sure did think about that a lot in 1979, but I didn't thank God for it at all. And maybe I should have. And by that I mean maybe I should have at least thanked God for Christy Brinkley. I mean, she was created by God, right? And everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. And that's the problem. I didn't receive Christy Brinkley with thanksgiving, but I wanted to take her without thinking about thanksgiving. But maybe if I would have said, Jesus, thank you for Christy Brinkley. That girl that you made and that you love, thank you for her. 
Well, then maybe I wouldn't have been so interested in taking Christy Brinkley and would have been a little more grateful for my incredible new girlfriend, Susan Coleman. Christy Brinkley's not evil, but my perception of her might be. How about drugs and alcohol? Did you, did you thank God for that? You don't have to raise your hand. Jesus said, as often as you drink this cup, do it in remembrance of me, and he gave thanks. I've always wondered if he was only talking about this cup, or he was talking about any cup containing alcohol, or any cup containing anything that he had created, like water or blood. Do this with me so it won't be an idol, so it won't have you, but you'll have it together with me. That's called communion. Maybe cars become holy. Maybe houses become holy. Maybe women become holy. Maybe wine becomes holy with just a word, a word that rides out on your tongue. Eucharisteo. That's Greek. It means thank you. It's the good decision. So how about that? What about good decisions? How many of you thanked God for good decisions, your good decisions? How many of you thank God in biblical lingo for your righteousness? Any of you thank God for your righteousness? I mean, you've all been righteous at, at least a bit, right? Have you ever loved somebody or loved anything at all? So did you thank God for your good decisions? If you don't thank God for good decisions, you must think that you made those good decisions. Like faith or hope or love. God is love. Did you make God? Maybe you don't make good decisions, but with good decisions, God in Christ Jesus is making you like all the time. If you don't thank God for your righteousness, well, you must be self-righteous, which is the very worst form of unrighteousness. It got Jesus crucified. Jesus is our righteousness, writes Paul. He's our righteousness, sanctification, and re redemption, according to Paul. God is love. To think that you are responsible for love is utterly irresponsible of you. But when you surrender to love, you'll give birth to love, and when you surrender to love, be sure to say thank you, for that was in fact love in you, causing you to love him like a seed dropped into the soil and coming to fruition. When people used to compliment Corey Timboom for one of her messages, she would picture herself receiving this beautiful bouquet of flowers, and then she said she would smell the flowers and hand them to Jesus, saying thank you, Jesus, for letting me smell your flowers. And now she didn't say this, but I think this also happened. I think Jesus handed them back to her and said, Corey, you mean our flowers. A communion. That's a good decision. But what about a bad decision? Okay, that would be number four. So ask yourself this question. Did you thank God for your bad decisions. I mean, your own bad decisions and other people's bad decisions. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9, Paul writes, God created all things. Okay? God created all things. Remember that. Ephesians 4, 4, he writes, everything created by God is good. That means every good decision is God or created by God and his word, right? And every bad decision is what? Not a thing. God created all things. Everything created by God is good. So a bad decision is like a, a no thing or a, a nothing. Every lie is the absence of truth. Every disobedience, an absence of love. Every sin is an absence of faith and love, like an empty space. So I don't know that you actually can thank God for nothing without the nothing immediately turning into a something called hope 
or something like hope. I mean, I mean, once you actually see a bad decision, right? Once you actually see it, you look back upon yourself and you actually see a bad decision, you naturally hope that it would become a good decision. That's called repentance. And it's a, it's a gift. So we have all made bad decisions which are an absence of God's good decision, which means that they were a nothing that we thought was a something, and now they are like an empty space in our, in our past. And Paul wrote this, where sin increased, and sin is like that nothingness, where sin increased, that would be in us, grace abounded all the more. Maybe we can't thank God for sin because sin is a lack of gratitude for grace. But maybe we can thank God that we have sinned in the past because in that empty manger, we're going to find some life. Maybe we can thank God that we have been disobedient, all of us, because he consigned all to disobedience in order to have mercy on all. God did that. So shouldn't we be grateful for that? Last week, I was just feeling really bad that I had been feeling sorry for myself. I mean, I felt sorry that I had been feeling sorry for myself and not rejoicing very much, but sad quite a lot, which made me feel even more sad about myself and my decisions. And then I had an idea. I remember I was sitting there and I just prayed, Jesus, Thank you that I'm poor in spirit. And then I kind of felt blessed. Like I was blessed and blessed to be a, a blessing. And then I prayed, Jesus, thank you that I'm sad. That I'm that I'm mourning. And then I felt glad, as if I were being comforted by the one that knew all about sad and glad. And I prayed, Jesus, thank you that I'm meek. That's hard for a dude to pray. Thank you that I feel like a little lamb. And then I, I kind of felt a little bit like a lion. Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. I pray, Jesus, thank you that I'm hungry and thirsty for righteousness. And then it felt like I, the unrighteous one, <laughs> was being blessed with righteousness. That was righteousness. I still need to pray, thank you, Jesus, that I've been persecuted for righteousness' sake. Thank you that I'm merciful. Thank you that I'm pure in heart. Thank you that I'm a peacemaker. Thank you for filling what I am not with who it is that I am. Thank you. I'm just saying that maybe we need to thank God for everything and the nothing because the nothing is like an empty stage set for the revelation of, of something. It's like an empty womb ready to be filled with the very glory of God. So thank God for everything and nothing, but what about the confusion, you know, between the two? Because that's usually where I live. Where you just don't know the difference. I mean, maybe that's why Paul wrote, thank him always and for everything in all circumstances. So number five, ask yourself, did I thank him for the confusion? You see, most of the time I feel like a field of wheat and, and weeds. Tares, to be specific. You know, tares, uh, they, they grow in the Middle East and they look like wheat. I feel like a field of wheat and weeds like good things and bad things all growing in the same dirt and I just can't sort them out. That's where I was last summer when I didn't know the will of God in Christ Jesus for all of us. Susan stuck her head in the office and said, he wants you to read 1 Thessalonians 5 and I read, rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in all circumstances. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you, Peter. So what is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you? watching or listening to this sermon. Well, I guess that you would just say thanks <laughs> and keep walking. Which direction, you ask? I'm not sure it matters. 
if you keep saying thanks and mean it. Because that is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your path, writes Solomon, Proverbs 3, 6. Do you realize that God upholds every moment of space and time with his word of power who happens to be your friend? He can make the path straight no matter which way you step because he has that power. Thank God always and for everything and just take a step. Just turn the page. If you're told to thank God always and for everything in everything, what does that mean except that nothing happens to you by chance? And everything, including the nothing in the something, is a gift of grace, and God is grace, and God is good. It means that you are a story being told, and when it's finished, you will see that everything is good, including every page of the story that's been written, your story, uh, good, and could not be better. No, we all hope this, right? In fact, we all teach this to our children instinctually. But we struggle to believe that God is that good and that powerful, that he's powerful enough to pull it off. And so what does he say to us? Just give thanks and turn the page. These are some of the books, or like the books anyway, that we used to read to our kids when they were um, little. They're called fairy tales because each one of them ends with this idea that they all lived happily ever after. And yet each and every fairy tale contains at least one very um, confusing page in which the first time through, at least the first time through, when you get to that page, you're not sure what's good and what's bad, what's evil and what's not evil, what's going to live and what's going to die. But you keep reading because you trust the, the author and, and the plot. So I love this story, um, The Lion King, but it contains this page. You get to this page right here, and, and you read, um, Scar is talking to Simba. If it weren't for you, Simba, your father would still be alive. <laughs> Why would I read that to my son, a five-year-old boy? That's terrifying. Why would it? Well, well maybe because one day I'll be dead. And something evil may whisper to my boy, it's your fault. And maybe that story sounds familiar to you, Adam. So just give thanks and turn the page. You see, it's fear and shame that keep us from turning the page. I read this one, uh, I think, we read a lot of them, uh, to my daughter, uh, Snow White great story until you get to this page, but they were too late. Snow White had already taken a bite of the poison apple and was lying lifeless on the floor. <laughs> Why would you read that to a five-year-old little girl before she falls to sleep? Well, because one day she might bite the apple and lay lifeless on the floor. And it's absolutely critical for her to know that right now she's not the author of her own story. You know how she learns that? By turning the page. If we think that we're the author of our own story, we'll seize control of the plot. We'll stop reading and we'll get stuck on one page in space and time. The devil keeps us in lifelong bondage through the fear of death. Not death the fear of death, because it keeps us from turning the page. If you weren't always trying to save your life, maybe you could live your life. If Peter wasn't always worried about himself, maybe he could be himself. I think this was my favorite story, Dumbo. For some reason, I could relate to it, but it has this absolutely horrifying page. Let's see here. 
Yeah. Dumbo crying for his mother thought he had no friends in the world as all the other elephants turned their back on him. <laughs> Why did you make me like this? Dumbo asked. Peter asked. Jonathan, Elizabeth, Becky, Susan, Coleman, you all asked. Why'd you make me this way? Well, give thanks and turn the page. For the very reason that you are rejected is the very reason that you will be accepted by all Dumbo. In fact, you'll save the entire circus. My friend uh, Tobin, you, some of you know Tobin, he pointed me to this researcher who interviewed 20,000 people asking each one the same question. This was the question. If you could erase the most traumatic experience of your life, and he had them think back on a traumatic experience, would you do it? Knowing that by erasing that moment, you would also erase everything that came about as a result of that moment. 99.99% said they would not. And not one of them had come to the end of their own story. We all love Simba because he thought he killed his own father. In a way he did, and in a way he didn't, right? We all love Snow White well, because she bit the, the apple. We all love Dumbo because of his ears. Because they had been a curse that became a blessing. I mean, if it's just a story about an elephant with airplane ears and that was it, and th you wouldn't even read it. Maybe their story is your story. And your story is Jesus' story. And so it's absolutely critical that you know that you are not writing this story so that you don't seize control of the plot, but that you would learn to say thank you for this day, thank you for this day that you have made, Lord God, and then turn the page. Number six, how about this? How about this? Did you thank God for this, this man on, on the tree and the cross? And now you probably did because you're in church and instinctually you know that you're supposed to. In fact, you even sing it. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid. But you, you demanded that price. I mean, this is a very confusing page of the story, don't you think? <laughs> is that good or evil? Is that life or, or, or death? When you thank God for this, you know, you're also thanking God for letting you do this. This is the worst thing that anyone has ever done. What each of us has done. And this is also the best thing that anyone has ever done. What he has done. You took his life, and he forgave, before gave his life to you, and so the only proper response is what? To say, thank you. This is the worst thing we ever did, and this is the best thing that has ever been done. And so every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is within them constantly praises, gives thanks to the Lamb on the throne. Reality is worship. This is the worst thing we ever did, and this is the best thing that has ever been done, and maybe this is actually the only thing that is ever done. What I mean by that is this is the Word of God in whom and by whom and through whom all things are created and sustained. In this is love, and love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love does not fail. This is the beginning and the end and the way in between. This is the only plot to every story that's any story. This is the plot to your story. Once you trust the plot, you can enjoy every moment in the story. Dumbo, Sleeping Beauty, Lion King. Oh, each terrifying the first time around when you're five years old. But then after that, over and over, the kids would be like, read it again, Daddy, read it again, read it again, read it again, read it again. 
I think Paul wrote, thank God always and for everything in everything because he actually believed that we were in, and I don't even know how to say this, but like some sort of ever-expanding fairy tale that's always been written but is being revealed in space and time. And God is so great and his plot is so good that he will fill every page of every story with the most glorious meaning such that one day each and all of us will turn around and say, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you without ceasing for we'll see that we each are good and everything is good and it is finished and then no longer be afraid of losing our lives. We'll begin to actually live our lives which are all one life, the life of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So I remember that there's like space and time are like that line that somehow all space and time are in Christ Jesus our Lord, the, the timeline that's being filled with eternity, and yet your story is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We're all timelines in Christ Jesus our Lord that's all filled with Jesus our Lord, and we all live this eternal amazing story together. That's when we, we start Living, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you and for all creation. You see, this tree is actually this tree, which is actually this tree. The tree doesn't change. The plot doesn't change. We change. <laughs> We wake up. So number six, did, did you thank God for the tree? And number seven, did you thank God for me? And by that I mean your old me. Did you thank God that you took his life on the tree? Well, that's a tough one. <laughs> did you thank God that you have sinned? See, I don't think that you can thank God for sin because sin is refusing to thank God. So uh, as soon as you actually thank God, you've ceased sinning. But I do think you can thank God that you have sinned because that's how he reveals his glory and makes you who it is that you actually are. You can thank God that you took his life on the tree because it reveals that he has always given to you his life on the tree, but then you will no longer want to ever take his life on the tree. He is your life, writes Paul <laughs> in Colossians 3, 4. Wake up in 1 Corinthians 15 and Ephesians 5. So number seven, did you thank God for your false self? Because number eight, then you will thank God for your true self. You see, I have, a really, I have a really, really hard time thanking God for me. Because I'm terribly ashamed of me. You know why I'm so ashamed of me? Because I'm so proud of me. Because I think I have actually earned me. <laughs> In other words, I think I create myself, save myself, and justify myself. I'm not ashamed of you because I'm really not proud of you. By that I mean I, didn't, I don't think that I created you. Maybe kind of sort of Elizabeth. <laughs> it wasn't hard work for me. But I don't think I created you or saved you or justified you. And so it's easier for me to believe the gospel for you. Or maybe I don't believe the gospel for you or for me. See, it all gets kind of confusion. Like I said, I'm like a field of wheat and tares. And I can't separate the two. But when I come to the cross, God separates me. He judges me. The cross destroys this illusion that I can create me, save me, and justify me. And it reveals the truth that I am created, saved, and justified in him. And that's why it's so important that I thank God for me. And his judgment of me. The old me and the new me. Because, you see, I could never begin to bear the weight of my own glory. If I always felt responsible for me, I would never ever enjoy me. I'd be utterly crushed by me. 
and you would be utterly crushed by you once you saw you. <laughs> if you feel responsible for yourself, you'll never be able to bear the weight of your own glory. Jesus gives you his glory. <laughs> Jesus is your glory. If you feel responsible for yourself, you'll never be able to bear the weight of your own glory, and you'll never be able to see God because God bears all things. God bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. You cannot bear the burden of love because you are the burden that love is bearing. God is love. And you are the creation of love. To be filled with love. And you already actually have been filled, if you would only could wake up to it. Uh, to be filled with love. Love is the uncreated creator. I mean, that's, that's crazy. The only appropriate response is, thank you. And thank you that I just said, thank you, so thank you for the Thank you, and thank you, thank, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. And now I, I know that we just took a really deep dive into some really uh, deep waters that none of us can comprehend. But you see, this message is extremely simple. Say thank you. You see, if you just say thank you with a mustard seed of faith that was planted in your heart with a word, that thank you will grow into a kingdom, into a universe of thanksgiving that is called the kingdom of God, or as some might call it, reality. Thank you destroys the illusion created by the lie believed in the garden of your soul that you have to create yourself, save yourself, sanctify yourself, justify yourself. In the eyes of God... Your father. Thank you undoes the lie of the snake. Thank you is believing the gospel. But who actually thanks God always and for everything in everything? Well, on the night that he was betrayed by all of us, he took bread and having given thanks, Eucharisteo. Hey, that's where this Eucharist thing comes from. Eucharisteo, thank you. He broke it saying, take and eat. This is my body given to you. Thank you. He thanked God for this. His body broken and given to us, given to all of us, each one of us. And in the same manner, after supper, he took the cup, and having given thanks, Eucharistio, he said, this is um, the covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, all of you. I mean, you realize that's giving thanks always and for everything in everyone and everything, including you. That's the word of God sanctifying, making holy all things, including you. And that's the will of God in Christ Jesus for you, coming out of you as a word as you say, thank you. So we invite you to come forward, tear off a piece of bread, dip it in, in the cup, put it inside yourself, and then as you go back to your seat, just... Just whisper it. Thanks. <laughs> That's the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Lord God, uh, together we say on the count of three, one, two, three, thank you. Amen. And now if you're like me, You'll be like all jacked up. Woo and then you'll walk out. Something will happen. You'll say, oh, God, what do you want from me now? <laughs> what am I supposed to do? 
I mean, at the end of the year, how are we going to, what do we do with the budget? What do we do with the house? What do, what do you want from me? Why is it like this? God, just tell me what you want me to do. See that no one repay evil with evil, Peter. Strive to do good to one another and, and uh, to everyone. Number two, rejoice always. Uh, number three, pray, just keep talking to me all the time. Pray constantly. And number four, you could do this right now, Peter. Give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Uh, believe the gospel, and you will give thanks. Amen.